Hello, I'm your host, Brian Callanan. What's the latest on a plan to recruit and retain more police officers in Seattle? What do you need to know about a spike in monkeypox cases in our area? And who's behind the new proposal for a Seattle Film Commission? Citywide Councilmember Sarah Nelson joins me to answer these questions and the ones you're sending in too, next on Council Edition. We're operating quarter to quarter with a net loss of officers and we've got to do something and this is precisely the first step we need to take. All that and more coming up next on City Inside Out, Council Edition. And here she is joining us, your citywide position nine council member, Sarah Nelson. Council member Nelson, thank you very much for joining us. I wanted to jump right into police recruitment with you, police recruitment and retention. Talk about this. You recently heard a report about this in the Public Safety Committee. So the SPD has had 109 separations, as they're called, officers leaving the department in the first six months of this year, about double what they expected. They've hired 30 officers, also much lower than what they were projecting. What do those numbers say to you? What are you doing to respond to that? Well, it says we've got a public safety crisis on our hands, and this is exactly the outcome that was intended by my resolution uh, for a staffing incentive program in SPD, which passed council in uh, May of this year. Um, and that resolution called for the development of a staffing incentive uh, program to accelerate the hiring of new officers, and it stated Council's intent to lift the uh, restriction uh, that Council imposed last year on the use of uh, unspent salary funds, um, and, uh, and this is precisely the outcome that we were looking for. So. I have to say that, yes, it's extremely worrisome that uh, we're operating quarter to quarter with a net loss of officers, and we've got to do something, and this is precisely the first step we need to take. Got it. Thank you for breaking that down. I wanted to bring up some other points of view on this because Councilmember Mosqueda in that meeting abstained on voting on the police hiring incentive plan because of a few concerns. During the meeting, she mentioned that she has talked with human services providers who hear from police often about this issue. Here's a clip of what she said in the meeting. From the officers' our own mouths, what they said is that what they need is not additional money, but a place to bring people. A PR firm for SPD won't help that. A hiring incentive approach won't help that. We also got an email in from Jimmy on this topic who wrote this. Can you be better at listening to marginalized groups who are disproportionately negatively impacted by police who then see police getting bonuses? And I should point out here, the majority of council members supported this legislation in committee, but there are still some concerns. That's why I wanted to bring this up. I just wanted to ask council member Nelson, how do you respond to these issues? The need for more human services, not hiring bonuses perhaps, and this basic overall message this might send to people who do feel marginalized by police. Well, I agree with that writer. And uh, because I am listening to people in communities most impacted by crime. And in one of the first committee meetings of the Public Safety uh, Committee, I, um, I read a letter that we had recently received from Mothers for Police Accountability. And they've been long active in this issue. And they called for uh, city council to hire more police officers quickly um, and stated our charter responsibility for doing so. So while council member Mosqueda might be talking to, um, to people in uh, the social services and, and some officers, I'm talking to people who live day to day with an unsafe city. And so I think that's where my responsibility lies. Got it. And in terms of what happens next with police alternatives, I know there's a lot of talk about that in the Public Safety Committee, too, trying to ramp some of those up, as well as trying to help get the police numbers up. Some thoughts about that, where that issue needs to go. I recognize that officers are responding to calls they're not equipped to deal with. And um, I think that, I don't think there's any disagreement with that. And uh, prior to coming on council, I know that there was um, there was a request uh, to develop alternative responses. And I I'm fine with that. Uh, however, I don't think that we need that we should rush into anything. Uh, we need to make sure that that response will work. And meanwhile, make sure that the um, that there are uh, that we've got an adequately staffed police department to respond to 
real crime. Um, I'm not talking about people in crisis. I'm talking about people that are committing crimes that are that are hurting our residents and businesses. I, and just briefly on the hiring bonuses, I know that's been a concern. Sometimes they've worked, sometimes they haven't worked as well. What makes you think this time around, this type of hiring bonus program is going to work for the SPD? Well, I think that we can put that one and a half page memo to rest um, <laughs> because this is, after all, the executive that is proposing this. Right. Um, and uh, the uh, there isn't any proof that incentives don't work. In fact, every other city in our region uh, has some form of staffing incentive program. And so we have to compete with those jurisdictions for a limited pool of officers. I'm going to switch gears and touch on a vote the council had recently to end the $4 per hour hazard pay boost for grocery workers. Uh, this was a measure put in place during the pandemic to help those workers. They're very much on the front line, but the council has now decided to end it a year and a half later. I'm trying to figure out what message Seattleites should draw from that. We are still in a state of emergency when it comes to COVID. Workers are potentially still at risk. Why did you vote to support this? Well, um, I think council did the right thing, obviously. And you asked what um, what voters should, uh, what message should they take away? And that is that we have got to adapt to evolving uh, conditions with this pandemic. And so uh, I voted in January to repeal hazard pay because that was imposed at a time when we did not have a vaccine and when the Delta variant with much higher mortality rates associated with it was circulating. We now have a vaccine and um, and we have frontline workers who um, who are as vulnerable as uh, grocery workers to um, to catching uh, COVID. Uh, and I believe that council needs to make sure that it the laws that it passes are um, are as universally applicable as possible. And this that only affected um, grocery workers. Times have changed, and we have to balance. Uh, the benefits to workers against um, the needs of our uh, of our constituents who um, who could be paying higher food prices, uh, who could be uh, looking at perhaps the independent grocery store in their neighborhood going under business because that was a, a steep increase in in um, their costs that they had to pay. So. Uh, on balance, um, that is what I felt in January. It's what I feel now. And um, I, I do believe that we are going to be living with this pandemic, uh, with COVID for a long time. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for yeah. breaking that down. I, I do think there's a larger issue, though, about the measures that have been passed during the height of the COVID pandemic and, and the ones that might not stay in place. Uh, recently, the council voted to keep this 15% cap on driver delivery fees that businesses pay, in effect, DoorDash, things of this nature. Uh, this measure was passed out of your city light committee. And I'm just trying to ask, what impact do you think it's going to have keeping this cap in place? Is this a sign that the COVID state of emergency is going to end sometime soon? Uh, some thoughts about this. Well, um, Councilmember Peterson and Strauss, the co-sponsors of the bill, were afraid that the civil emergency would end, this, um, the 15% cap would end, and uh, small businesses, my constituents and the customers, would then be facing a, a sharp increase in the cost that they pay to, uh, to be on these delivery apps. And so um, I think that the immediate benefits are going to be to these, these restaurants that have been hardest hit of all sectors, I would say, with the pandemic. And uh, we wanna make sure that they stay open and um, they're still de dealing with lost revenue uh, from COVID. And so this is designed to help them. I, I wanted to stick with the pandemic topic if we could here. And yeah. uh, we're dealing with a, an epidemic, if you will, with monkeypox. It's been declared a national emergency. You got cases doubling in our state every week with most of those cases happening in Seattle and King County. Uh, health officials briefed the council about this very recently. What do you want people in Seattle to know about monkeypox? I want them to know I'm listening to them. In fact, um, I would... I received several emails from constituents, uh, very convincing that uh, Seattle and King County needed to do more and more aggressively, which is why I brought it up at briefings first time anybody had publicly spoken about it. So um, what I want them to know is that uh, I am paying attention and um, I will be pushing for um, the, the members that are on, um, on that board, the public health board, uh, to be fighting for um, proactive steps to educate the public and make vaccines available. I applaud the, um, the pop-up clinic that, uh, that occurred last weekend. That's exactly what we need to be doing. 
other cities are doing more. And so I want to make sure that we're doing absolutely as much as we possibly can and that Seattle is advocating for its constituents. Absolutely. Thank, thank you for breaking down that piece. I wanted your thoughts about some proposals coming down from Mayor Harrell. One, to make $2 million available to businesses via grants so they can make improvements to existing or new commercial spaces here. Then you've got another issue here, uh, Seattle Restored, aiming to activate vacant commercial storefronts in downtown and across the city. I'm trying to figure out what impact you think these programs might have. I'm thinking about your Economic Development Committee here. And will they be enough to revitalize businesses downtown, for example? A lot of people simply aren't coming back to work down downtown, uh, in person, that is. Well, there's a lot to unpack there, but what I have to say is, um, is that I am thrilled with these proposals. And you said, what impact do, will they have? I'll tell you what impact they won't have. A small business who is forced to leave a location because their lease is up, or that needs to expand, or just fix things in their existing business, place of business, uh, would ordinarily not have the access to these funds. It's extremely difficult to finance tenant improvement, um, tenant improvement because banks don't like making loans for things that, um, that they can't seize back, frankly. Uh, so this, that program fills a gap in, um, in resources that small businesses can use. And it's an anti-displacement tool. Uh, it'll help businesses uh, stay in neighborhood and keep that wealth and those jobs in community. Same with Seattle Restored. This is basically we're taking a resource that, um, well, it can be seen as a negative, an empty storefront, and turning it into a resource for uh, artists or small businesses to move into, and it, it adds life to the street. And, um, you know, that's exactly the kind of creativity that we need to be uh, doing over and over again. So I am all in for those. And, and you're right, um, as Chair of Economic Development, these are the kinds of programs that I am seeking, supporting, and helping to develop. Okay, thank you for breaking those pieces down. And I wanted to make sure I pointed out, you met with business leaders all around the city, business leaders from all around the city a couple months ago to talk about a victim's compensation fund basically broken windows dollars, if you want to call it that, for businesses impacted during the pandemic. I know this was approved in last year's budget, and I'm sure some businesses are telling you, we've been needing this help for a long while. Where are the, where's the money here? I'm trying to figure out when this victim's compensation fund might be in place. What needs to be taken care of here? Well, let me be clear. We're talking about two different things. Okay. Um, I convened a roundtable discussion with small business owners and representatives from neighborhood business districts to talk about the impacts of crime. And several recommendations were put forward, one of which was um, help repairing uh, damaged storefronts. And so um, that is a high priority for them and, and that is in progress, stay tuned. Okay. And so uh, we have to do something to directly help small businesses that have been uh, the victims of crime. Now, um, when it comes to the victim compensation fund, I believe that's what it's called. Yes. Um, uh, that is, um, that was an initiative last year. It's a very small amount of money. It's about a hundred thousand dollars. Any money helps. Um, but, uh, there are a lot, that'll, um, there are a lot of businesses that have incurred thousands of dollars. And so I, I, I agree with the spirit, um, and whatever we can do to, to help, to help businesses who've been victims of theft, damage, et cetera. That's great. Uh, I just want to be clear that there are two different things. Thank you. Thank you for breaking those pieces down. I know there's a lot of businesses that have that question. I clearly have that question too. So I appreciate that. Uh, we've had a couple of emails come in, Council Member Nelson, uh, for you for the show, including a land use question from Eric. I wanted to throw this one at you. He writes this, I am well off. My child is attending college in Seattle, which I am paying for. Landlords are pressuring me to apply for MFTE housing, multifamily tax exemption housing, because my daughter has no income and would qualify. Isn't that an MFTE loophole you should close? Eric, as always, thank you for the emails. Interesting question. Councilmember Nelson, you serve on the Land Use Committee. Any thoughts on this one? Well, uh, I have been, um, I've been talking about improving the MFTE program so that, more, um, so that more developers participate because we're not going to be able to subsidize our way out of our housing affordability crisis. We need to, uh, we need to have private developers make units afford, um, available that are affordable within, within buildings. I did not know that um, uh, that there was a gaming of the system that that email uh, indicates. I would suggest, I don't know what advice I would give that person, but, um, but in general, 
MFTE is one of our tools to uh, to build affordable housing and make it available uh, at uh, at no cost to the city. We are not building these units. Um, it is a tax, you know, it's a tax break for the developer, um, and the benefits are that uh, we have more affordable housing. Got it. Thank you for breaking that down and engaging the question. I always get a lot of interesting ones on the show here. <laughs> uh, we also got in one from. Ethan, uh, about a streetlight issue in his neighborhood in West Seattle. It's apparently been going on for a few years. I'm going to forge that message to you, Councilmember Nelson, and hopefully you can help out uh, one of our viewers there. Ethan, thank you very much for writing. But I did want to talk about a broader city light issue with you, if I could. Again, a part of the committee you oversee here, there's a rate increase on the way for next year, which happens yearly with city light. It's pretty normal here. But the numbers I'm seeing, an average increase of 4.5% for all city light customers. It'll be a little bit higher for residential customers. It's a jump of about five bucks per month, uh, per month, maybe a little bit less than that. But this is a bigger percentage increase than in terms of what we saw in 2022. I just wanted to try to get the background here. What's going on with this and what's pushing those rates up? Well, what's pushing those rates up first and foremost is that we did not raise rates in 2021. Uh, because of the pandemic. And so uh, city council approves new rates every two years. And so uh, we were overdue for a reconsideration of our rates. Um, and in the meantime, what has happened is that uh, it's become more expensive to generate and deliver electricity to our customers um, because of high inflation, which is uh, I think it's about two thirds higher than what was projected uh, earlier when um, when the last rates were in place mm -hmm. and keeps changing, keeps going up. And so uh, that, that impacts mm -hmm. copper wiring and all these other kind of costs. Is that kind of part of it? Yeah, yeah it impacts mm -hmm. all of our costs. Um, materials, metals have increased mm -hmm. in cost by uh, 70 to 80 percent. So, so we've got all of these um, external pressures, plus the fact that uh, we've we've got a lag in in raising rates. Look, nobody likes a rate hike, a rate raise, but um, this every two years, this is what happens. And um, uh, City Light does a good job of trying to absorb these costs and not pass them on to the rate payers. Uh, City Light is a public utility, has lower rates than than. The vast majority of other utilities, and they do a good job of trying to um, to uh, deliver the same level of service and uh, and and protect our ratepayers against against increases that are just um, really difficult to bear. Thanks, Councilmember Nelson. I wanted to switch gears a bit and bring in a special guest at this point to join Councilmember Nelson to talk about a plan for a Seattle Film Commission, and that would be Kate Becker from the King County Executive's Office. Kate, thank you very much for joining us here. But Councilmember Nelson, I wanted to talk about this because you've been discussing this idea of a film commission for quite some time. I want to start with you and ask what this film commission is all about. Why are you pushing legislation for this? Well, the short answer is I'm pushing legislation for this because this is what our film stakeholders want and have been calling for for years. So just to back up, um, Seattle has uh, has been a vibrant, creative city. We've lost our edge when it comes to filmmaking in, in specific. And um, the a film commission is a way to bring industry professionals to the table to help the city design policies, programs, initiatives that will not just support the film industry, but also uh, attract film production from across the country and, um, and, and hit our goals, which are workforce development, economic development, equity, and, and a whole host of other things. So the bottom line, some people say, well, why a film commission? And and I have to say that, um, you know, we talk about growing our creative economy. Yeah. Well, the best way to do that is to focus on film because film is the most commercially viable art form, employing um, artists from the greatest number of creative disciplines. And it'll help us target our policies that end up helping people who work in a number of different creative industries. But the bottom line is a film commission has, uh, will help us uh, be smart about how we grow the film, the, the film industry here in Seattle. And it's about time. And I am simply um, putting forward what the community has wanted for a long time. And I'm sure that Kate can speak to that. Oh yeah, no, and you got to stop the <laughs> the Seattle scenes being shot in Vancouver. That's, that's a big part Indeed. of the issue here. But I wanted to make sure I asked you this question, Kate. Uh, the county has been doing a lot of work with this. It started up its creative economy initiative a couple of years ago. 
has a, made a major investment to build a film production studio on Harbor Island. And also very importantly, the state's kicking in some extra money into this effort. Can you help us out with the larger picture, the county and state, how they're gonna work together with the city on this? Absolutely. So Executive Constantine has long known the needs of the film industry and been a champion for the film industry and has known that we needed a production facility. Simultaneously, when the pandemic hit, we had a whole lot of film industry professionals out of work. And so the opportunity came together to really uh, put to better and higher use a 117,000 square foot warehouse on Harbor Island and convert it into two sound stages and a production facility. The region has needed this for a long time. In order to compete in the film industry, you must have a place to make film, and we haven't had that. The last soundstage of any scale that we have had in this region was the Northern Exposure Stage, which broke down when they left town in 1996. And we have not had a big soundstage here since that time. Wow. And I just, in touching on what the state's doing here, this increasing of the business and occupation tax credit limit, as I understand it, for the motion picture competitive, competitiveness program, moving that from three and a half million to 15 million. I think that state piece is gonna be big here too. It's going to be huge. It's a perfect um, time for the city to be moving forward on a new initiative with a film commission and really centering film in the city. And then the county having our work well underway and the state having this new incentive. The opportunity is grand for our state right now. Got it. Uh, Councilmember Nelson, back to you on this. And I wanted to center in on a point you were making earlier about the number of workers who might be getting involved with this. I thought it was very interesting in the presentation to see an estimated 250,000 workers in creative industries in our region. It's a very important part of the economy and a big one too. But this question around growing this industry sounds great, but how do you do it in an equitable way and make sure people who might've been excluded from these kinds of opportunities in the past get in on the game? Well, thank you very much for bringing this up because this is a fundamental um, uh, rationale for this commission, and there will be there is a uh, a position on the commission for someone who represents um, underrepresented represented communities. Look, film is a is a sector that um, that has. Um, Living wage jobs, un many of them union jobs that don't require uh, a, a college degree to get into. And so if we build, if we grow the film industry, more people can take advantage of opportunities to develop their uh, careers in the in the industry or into other sectors. So um, we need to make sure that, as I said in the beginning, the whole, this is about, um, workforce development and and uh, creating opportunities to build wealth and livelihoods. And so I believe that, um, and in fact, many of the people that were on the film task force that preceded this effort uh, did represent uh, people from a diversity of communities. And this is precisely why they said that a film commission was important, that so that their needs and the needs of, uh, of low income people could be advanced and, um, and that we strengthen the community enough so that there are opportunities for everyone. Got it. Thank you for that. Kate, I wanted to get your sense of the urgency behind this because I was reading a piece in Crosscut a couple of days ago that talked about the recent arts and culture report from the Puget Sound Regional Council. And that report had a survey that showed a third of the people, people I should say, working in the creative economy, especially younger ones, are considering leaving that sector of the economy. And I'm not trying to throw cold water on your efforts at all here, but I'm trying to figure out, do you think the work you're doing can help turn that tide? We need to keep our talent here in this region. Mm -hmm. They are the folks who not only tell our stories, they also, the film industry also works with all our corporations, our businesses, creates the advertising content, the commercial content. We need to keep these folks here. So yes, the, that report, which I was interviewed for, is indeed a troubling report. We can't have our, our creatives and our talent leaving this region. We've already lost a lot of the film industry. We're hoping we can woo them back now. Mm -hmm. um, because um, who doesn't want to live here, right? So uh, we're hoping we can bring them back here, but we can't afford to lose anymore. And we all need to work together collectively to make sure that we are keeping the talent in this region. Got it. Thank you very much for that. To wrap up here, Councilmember Nelson, just a quick look at the timeline ahead. What sort of costs and logistics are involved with setting the film commission up? When do you think the council might be able to take a vote on this? Cost and logistics. Uh, this uh, the person staffing the film commission will be the person who's uh, 
who knows film in Seattle? And so we do have uh, the staffing that is that that will be um, that will be working on the commission. So that is not an added cost. Okay. Um, and uh, we've got to act fast because everything is aligning right now with the state's incentives with this uh, studio that will provide us a, a space for for film production. And so the next steps for committee on film commission are that at the uh, at our next meeting on September 14th, we will have a discussion discussion of the uh, formally introduced legislation, hopefully voted out of committee that day, and it'll go to full council on September 20th. And then early next year, we go, first of all, we go into budget, right? Mm -hmm. So that right. takes care of the rest of the year, but early yeah. next year, we're going to empanel the, com the commission quickly. I am hoping for the first couple of months so that we can have these industry experts giving us advice and helping us design programs as soon as possible. Wow, looking forward to hear more about that. Councilmember Nelson, also Kate Becker from the King County Executive's Office. Thank you for joining me on this. That's all the time we have for now on Council Edition. We will see you next time.